So it all started really with Operation Choke Point during the Obama administration, right? And that's when uh, the Obama administration started pressuring banks and they, the banks chose to reclassify firearm transactions as high-risk categories, right? So instantly you had a bunch of banking institutions that said, we don't want to deal with anything high risk. So a lot of people lost their processing. Don't stay complacent. Yeah. Because, you know, we've seen these breeding grounds mm -hmm. for bad gun laws. And um, you, you'll see it introduced one place and then oh, it yeah. catches like wildfire. But the more people that stand up and say absolutely not, the more people who are on record and that we can file lawsuits and we can do those things on the on the flip side of that. And that's not to say that that lawsuits are the end all be all. It is um, so much easier to fight something before it is passed than it is to fight with a lawsuit. Now that we're all pumped up, let's uh, introduce our next guest. Greg, 2A Commerce. Greg from 2A Commerce. How are you? Good, guys. Thanks for having me on. So glad you can be here. Uh, tell everyone a little bit about yourself and uh, 2A Commerce. Sure. Uh, I've been uh, developing software after I got out of the Navy for about 20 years. Uh, we specialize in uh, custom e-commerce builds, uh, payment processing, uh, integrating point of sale systems and inventory management systems. So one of the things that makes us unique is that we are like platform agnostic, right? And what I mean by that is we do not, do not take a business and squeeze them into software that we wrote or we developed. We figure out what the business needs and then we apply software tools that are available on the market or write custom function for them that allows that business to operate the way they want to operate. So, so, there's a lot of e-commerce platforms out there. Mm -hmm. What makes you guys stand out and <clears throat> what is the whole backstory of why you guys started this whole journey? I love that question, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so so we had been doing uh, development, uh, well, like I just said, for we've been doing it for 20 years. So about five years ago, 2019, um, you know, my, my business partner and I watched big tech kind of come into the censorship thing before it became mainstream thinking, before the general public was really aware of what was going on. And in 2019, Shopify shut down their very first completely legal firearm store. And um, at the time, we had, um, we had been in the music industry, actually. We wrote a bunch of custom apps in the, in the uh, music space and, you know, had a lot of fun with that. Uh, we had done a lot of non-for-profit work. Um, and I looked at him, I said, hey, man, um, we are the guys that need to do something about this. And so we decided that we were going to enter the gun space. You know, he, he grew up in the, in the country in Tennessee, um, grew up with guns his whole life. Uh, I'm a Navy submarine veteran. I grew up with guns my whole life. Uh, love, love our country. We love our Second Amendment rights. And we were like, we're the conservative guys that hold these values that are in the tech industry, which is predominantly very, very left-leaning, as you know. And uh, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know anything about the industry, but we're going. And uh, literally every single person that was a professional in my life at the time that I told them that we were going to go do this, they told me, don't do it. It's too high risk. It's a, you know, you can't, you know, you're going to lose your business and blah, 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 blah. Well, it's the best decision I ever made, <laughs> quite <laughs> frankly, right? So we did. We entered it because we wanted to create a, a space where nobody would get shut down. Nobody would lose their payment services. Nobody would lose their server hosting. Um and what we discovered is that there was not a single company, to my knowledge, even to date, there's not a single company in the entirety of the gun industry that does custom integration services the way that we do. Um, so we, we kind of, you know, decided we're going to go down this road. And having made that decision, we also found that we filled a gap in the space, in the gun space, that, that nobody else was filling. And we kind of randomly fell into that. So that was kind of neat to have happen, you know. A big part of the back-end work on a website is something that, as a professional who used to do it, absolutely hated, and that's search engine op 
optimization. Oh, yeah. It is awful. Mm-hmm. And for people who've never done search engine optimization, it is hours and hours and hours of putting in a lot of work. Mm-hmm. What is, and we'll shorten it to SEO, what, do you, what is the big deal with SEO? What does that do for a company? Do, how does it help them, you know? The, yeah, sure. I, so, so not only do we have uh, tech companies that are deplatforming us or payment companies that are removing our ability to transact, we also have uh, advertising platforms such as Google AdWords, uh, Facebook, Instagram, that won't actually allow us to even post advertisement in it, right? So in the gun space, we have to get very clever on how we're going to get people to our websites, how we're going to get people to know who we are and what we are. So search engine optimization is, in my opinion, one of three most important tools that every single Every single company, it doesn't matter if you're a manufacturer, if you're a retailer, it doesn't matter where you fit in the gun space, you should be doing search optimization. Because what search optimization does is it allows you to return in Google. Now, the interesting thing about your question is that we inherit a lot of websites that are already built, right? And what most people don't understand is that there's a right way to technically implement the back-end architecture, as you, as you mentioned, on a website so that it's even prepared to be set up for search, right? So a lot of times when we get a site, before we even get to the ability to do the search marketing, we spend three months retooling it just to get it to a point where Google will even take time to look at it, right? So page speed loads optimize. You have, uh, you don't have high um, text, low, low text to HTML ratios that are happening. Um, your internal linking structure is working properly. You don't have broken links. There's a bunch of technical items that are related to how you actually get your website to show up in Google. Um, And a lot of people are frustrated. And a really interesting thing about search also is that most search optimization companies, uh, there's only a couple of us in the gun space. I know of like one other. um, But most of them do not understand the nature of what we're selling, right? Right. And so um, a lot of the businesses that had previously hired a search optimization company leave them and they come to us and they're completely frustrated because every time they wanted to implement a new marketing strategy or every time they wanted to um, bring a new product to market, the company they were working with didn't understand the vernacular of what they were talking about, right? So when you're doing your marketing in the gun space, it's very quick to um, identify people who don't really know what they're talking about, right? (laughs) You know, one of my one of my <clears throat> biggest pet peeves is when somebody refers to a magazine as a clip, for example, right? I'm like, oh gosh, it drives <laughs> me nuts. So it's stuff like that when it comes to the marketing and it comes to the digital side, it's very important to not only have the content pieces, but you have to have the technical infrastructure right, or you won't even rank. Well, and that's the the thing with SEO. Like mm-hmm. old school SEO used to be like word stuffing. Everything. So if you had 9 mil ammo, it would be like 9 mil, 9 mil ammo, right. 9 mil. Google changes their SEO protocol. All the time. All the time. So mm-hmm. you may rank for like 40,000 words one day, and the very next day it's like five. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So we use like a, uh, a tracking software um, that we are constantly monitoring the sites that we're doing search optimization for. And it will show you. You've lost all these keywords. Here are keywords you've gained, and it's completely changing all the time. Yeah, you're exactly right. So I'm, and what we do is, well, I can actually show you, I can show you exactly what key terms you've lost, why you've lost them, right? So um, you're, yeah, you're right on with that. So one of the things that um, I first learned about 2A Commerce Mm -hmm. was on the credit card processor side. Mm -hmm. And Listen, everyone listening to this podcast, you know, I know, everyone knows that the attack on the Second Amendment is not surface level attacks. That's right. Um, And there's been some major things that have happened, um, some a few years old, some a little newer, when it comes to banking Mm -hmm. and protecting gun owners, their information. Um, can you go into a little bit of that side? Yeah, I can. And I will tell you that it's still very frustrating to deal with. 
um, before I dig into it. Like it's still a problem. Um, so it all started really with Operation Choke Point during the Obama administration, right? And that's when uh, the Obama administration started pressuring banks and they, the banks chose to reclassify firearm transactions as high risk categories, right? So instantly you had a bunch of banking institutions that said, we don't want to deal with anything high risk. So a lot of people lost their processing, right? So that's where it began and it hasn't ended. So uh, Visa and MasterCard uh, just last year, um, well, all the card brands, actually, um, just last year decided to create what's called an MCC code that designates a gun store. It's specific to a gun store. MCC code stands for Merchant Category Code. It's a code that the banks use to um, identify what type of business is running transactions, right? So by creating this, what the banks have effectively done is they have made a way to create a private gun buyer list. So if somebody goes into a gun store, let's say they spend $1,500, they don't know if that buyer bought a new rifle or if they just bought a ton of ammo. But what they do know is that buyer went into the gun store and he bought $1,500 worth of something where the probability is pretty high that they probably just purchased a firearm, right? So they, they can't yet track on the per item basis, but they can definitely track who's buying what at what type of store at this point, right? And that's something that like most people don't understand is, is going on, that there's these very insidious things that are happening in the background of um, our society. And it's not just, it's not just our industry, right? It's all, it's all variety of industries. It's coming down to just simple ideology. They don't agree with you. You can't transact. You can't run your business, you know? So that's a, that's a recent thing that happened uh, in the last four months. The, um, the banks got together, and this has been a colossal pain in the neck for us uh, probably for the last three months. Um, four months ago, they come out with this survey that everyone that uh, is an FFL has to fill out as they're coming on board. If you've already got your processing, you're good. If you're starting a new processing account, you now have to run the survey. And the survey is two, three pages long. Most of the questions are redundant. The, the answers are inherent to the fact that you have an FFL, right? So why are they creating this extra layer of questions? Well, these questions go to an underwriter. Most of these underwriters don't necessarily prefer firearms. And so what happens because they don't actually understand what they're back to the SEO people that are doing that, right? Because they don't actually understand what the vernacular is within the questions and how we're answering them, they will close accounts. I literally am working on an account right now to get open. That is a uh, tactical um, promotion company, right? They do a pretty cool marketing uh, strategy on how they sell and promote tactical gear. They are not an FFL. They do not sell guns. They do not do anything ATF regulated. The underwriter literally is requiring that we prove that they don't sell guns. Well, how do you want us to do that? They don't sell guns. They don't sell anything regulated by the ATF, right? So you have these people that are doing these reviews and they're looking at this documentation. They just don't understand what they're looking at. And then their biases take over. Oh, this is tactical. It must be bad. And it definitely has to be guns because it has the word tactical in it, right? And that's literally what we're dealing with. You know, it's kind of like the people who think the, you know, the fully automatic, semi-automatic, right? <clears throat> it's the same thing. <clears throat> well, we talked to... Matador Arms a few weeks back, mm -hmm. and they were talking about how they had they were they had orders getting skimmed, so like the, people were putting in orders for them, and some they would show up, but the money would be taking from the banks would be holding that that orders until it came up to about fourteen thousand dollars that the bank refused to give to them because they were holding it because they sold what they deemed as dangerous goods. Yeah, so I, that's without knowing the full context yeah. of that of that scenario, uh, I couldn't 
speak directly to that, right? But what I can tell you is this, that um, there's a lot of fraud with credit cards, right? And so the banks have these um, automated fraud detection triggers, right? And um, these automated fraud detection uh, triggers, what they do is cause funds to go on hold. Because the banks, and it's weird, it's not the banks, it's actually the cards, right? Because you've got the banks as a function as an intermediary. It's the card brands, Visa, MasterCard, Amex. Excuse me. So, So what happens is, that fraud trigger alert hits, they freeze and hold that money because what the bank is actually worried about is um, a potential chargeback. So you commit the fraud, it's your credit card, you call the bank and say, this isn't my purchase. Then what happens is you're going to hold that money from me because if it wasn't, if I didn't verify that this person was who they were, I then have to give that money back to that person because the the cards work for the card holder. They don't work for the merchant, right? The the cards the card the cards customers the card brands customers are the people that hold the card, not the merchants that are taking the transaction. Even though they're taking our money on the transaction, not the customers, right? right. So you would think if they're taking our money that we would be the customer, but that's just not the way it works. Um, so what we do though is we rather than leaving the merchant to fend for themselves and, and figure that out, right? There's people on our team that when those types of problems come up, they call us and then we deal with the bank for them. And that's one, that's another thing that makes us a little unique also with respect to the card processing piece, right? So even with these, um, these uh, questionnaires that I just told you about, that they just rolled out with the questionnaires, even, even with those, we are the guys that go to, we know how to articulate to these underwriters. We know how to p- pressure on them. And, you know, it's interesting because you, you can have a bank that's like, yes, we underwrite firearms. We will do high risk transactions, high risk, right? Um, but you have this underwriter whose job is to not open up accounts if they don't meet all the criteria, right? So, Literally, there are times where we escalate well above the underwriter's head. It gets pushed back down from the top, and then they we get the accounts open, right? So even though the banking institution supports it, they might have an employee that doesn't, and that employee becomes the roadblock. So it's very weird, right? There's all these like little nuancy complexities with this whole process, and it's not as straight as streamlined as as most people think. It's you know there's five layers in a transaction. You've got the gateway, you've got the card brands, you have the processor, you have the underwriting bank, and then you have the agency like us that open the account on behalf of the customer. There's five layers that are happening right there. With all these card brands uh, uh, doing these merchant codes and, and things like that, do you see more stores or more requests from customers to these stores asking for ACH or direct from the bank? We don't, we wouldn't see that, right? That would be something that's happening at the store level, but even ACH is still a transaction that is recorded, right? Cash is not, I mean, that's really what it is. Um, I will tell you that we started working on a project last year um, before the, um, I can't remember the name of the the big uh, crypto trade um, exchange that uh, went bankrupt. Um, what was it? I know what you're talking. Anyway, about. yeah, you know what I'm talking. I can't remember. I can't remember the name of the company. It's just slipping my mind. Anyway, we were actually working on building a crypto payment gateway, right? And uh, we built it. We completely built it. And we were working with um, a couple of partners in order to make it work. And one of the partners was going to, we were going to use what's called USDC, US um, dollar coin, right? It tracks one-to-one with the US currency. So if you bought a $1,000 rifle and uh, you paid with USDC, what happens is when you go to take your money out, you're getting 1,000 US dollars because regardless of, the value of crypto in that whole crypto thing. Um, 
you know, that was always the risk with crypto. If I use Bitcoin today, I could have more money than what they actually bought it for. Or today I could have less money than what the um, customer bought it for. Right. So that's the risk that you won with crypto. So we built this whole gateway and um, this whole debacle happens. The company that runs USDC uh, was uh, the SEC filed a lawsuit against them. And so basically the whole thing shut down before we were actually able to bring the full product to market. We had it tested. It was functioning. It was running. This was at SHOT Show last year. So um, we actually had we actually had T-shirts that said we make crypto work for the firearms industry, right? Because we did. We literally built the software that would allow a gun store to sell a gun for $1,000 and get $1,000 without the worry of, you know, the volatility. So it's still sitting back there on the back burner. We're kind of sitting watching and waiting to see what happens with it. Um, but. Yeah, that's where it is. So yeah. let's kind of go back to, sorry, let's go back to the security aspect because mm -hmm. I know that that is something that you guys have really been pushing as far as protecting the individual as much as humanly possible mm -hmm. through the transaction process. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you guys don't control what Discover, Visa, MasterCard, American Express do. Yeah, but um versus a couple years ago, um, one of the pr credit card processors gave uh, a list of customers to the ATF. Um, and I know that you guys are, are very much against that. Kind of go in, go into that. I mean, there's nothing we can do about that, right? That, that list would be completely out of our hands. The type of stuff that we do is... Um, we make sure, so I'll give you an example. On an e-com site, um, WooCommerce, there's a couple of big platforms, right? Woo WooCommerce is an open source, built on WordPress. It's very good. There's a bunch of great stuff. Big Commerce is good, right? We like Big Commerce. Um, we like Drupal Commerce. We like Magento. And the key is, and like, we're not going out to sell any one of these systems, right? We will work with the customer to identify which one of those systems makes the most sense for them based on their current operations. Yeah. So one of the ways that we work on the security side is to ensure that like WordPress, for example, is it is a fact that uh, I read a report about a year ago that WordPress is responsible for 90% of all internet hacks. Well, there's two reasons for that. Number one, WordPress is the most prolific content framework existing on the internet. And number two, <laughs> it's the most ill-maintained by the people who are implementing it. So it's not that WordPress itself, and I have this debate with some, I had this debate recently with another tech guy. I'm like, come on, man. It's not that WordPress is not secure. It's that it's not maintained. So if you maintain <laughs> WordPress security with its protocol, with, uh, with its uh, security releases rather, um, it's a completely secure platform. So from a technical standpoint, we are working to just make sure that that type of information is not accessible, right? Um, when it comes to whether or not a bank or a or a gateway or a card brand wants to give up info, it's completely out of our hands. And that's a beautiful thing about crypto, actually. <laughs> and um, I didn't think we'd talk about crypto on this, but it's kind of it's still it's still a fascinating uh, element of our society that few people really understand. Um, but one of the fascinating things about cryptos we've referred to is pseudonymous, right? Some people have tried to say it's anonymous, but it's not. It's pseudonymous. You can see that somebody conducted a transaction on the blockchain. You cannot see who that person was. You cannot see what they bought, right? And so because of that, if somebody wanted to... Um, get a warrant, they'd have to get a warrant to find out what that transaction was for a single transaction. You'd have to have a warrant for that transaction in order to be able to figure out who that person was. It's you're able to, but you still couldn't figure out what they bought. It's part of the power of it. Right. So, yeah. <clears throat> now being in a firearm space, um, Marketing can be hard. Yeah. Uh, we see all the social media platforms kind of going after us. How is How important are 
the, the few things I'm going to put them in order, how I see them as important. Uh, first off is content on your website and, or content in general. Mm -hmm. So that being video content, mm -hmm. uh, blogs, things like that, things that live on your website. Uh, two, I would say is your email list mm -hmm. because Absolutely. it is huge. And then three would be your SEO. Now, I put those in those orders because I, I do believe like education is always key. And if you can educate your customers, bring them in yeah. through videos and blogs. And then your email list is, if you build a big enough email list, you could, you do good things. Um, how do you, they kind of all connect. They do. But, uh, but how, most does not, by the way. Right. So how do you, how do you prioritize what, as a company, let's just say you're starting off in the two A space. How, where do you prioritize your focus at first? Is it building emails? Is it building content? Is it building SEO? Is it a combination of all? Mm -hmm. um, because personally, I see, and this is what I, I've argued with a lot of people about this is that YouTube and video content is just a giant search engine that you need to make sure that all your videos are SEO that they meet the SEO. That's right. So people have always like, what do you mean by that? I'm like, YouTube is the second largest search engine. Exactly. Next to Google. Correct. So. Bigger than Bing, bigger than Yahoo, yeah. bigger than all of them. So how do you prioritize what's what and how, what would you like suggest? I love this question, but everything marketing is my favorite. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I've been doing tech for 20, over 20 years. Right. Um, I have an MBA in marketing. Um, I like to tell people I'm an educated redneck. There's only three of us in the country. <laughs> <laughs> but um, th first of all, if, if, if you're running anything e-com, right, you have to have email. Yeah? Yeah. So when you get into email, and, and that's the simplest. So there's no reason not to, right? But it's people miss it still. It's amazing that, that people will still... Or some people will say, ah, well, nobody looks at email anymore. I'm like, well, we can show you that they do, yeah, right? So there's, then the email gets complicated because email can be something as simple as sending out a text blast to 5,000 people, or you can set up complete automation sequences, right? So that depending on what person entered your website and did what action, they enter a particular funnel within your marketing strategy, right? And they're now segmented based on what they were looking at. And you can then schedule or automate um, your correspondence with that particular user based on that very specific thing they were looking for, right? So email can get very complex. So you could go from, you know, a $40 a month email service all the way up to spending, you know, five, six, seven thousand $7,000 just on your email marketing, right? Um, Social is very interesting, and I think a lot of people get frustrated with social, and I think part of it is because they don't couple it with something like search. And I can explain. Um, with social, you, I, I like to use the, uh, I told you I was in the music industry before, right? And I like to use this analogy for, the, for this very specific thing. When you have a song that comes out at the beginning of the summer, right? It's the summer hit. It blows up and everybody's rocking out to this song. And by the end of the summer, the song kind of starts to sunset on the backside of the hill. And then next summer, it'll occasionally make it into a rotation. And then the following summer, it makes it a little less into the rotation and so on and so forth, right? And then 15, 20 years down the road, it becomes a classic and everybody's listening to it again. Social content, in my opinion, is exactly the same way. You can pick any major social influencer and they'll put a video out and everybody will watch it and you'll see this massive spike hit your website and then all of a sudden you it does this. I can show you this over and over in analytics with, um, with our um, search optimization tracking software. I can show you four different ways from Sunday exactly this trend and every time. So you spend all this money on that marketing initiative, which is good money spent, by the way. I'm not saying not to do it. What I'm saying is, is that you're missing the long tail from that, right? So if you couple that with a search strategy or a landing page tracking strategy where we can then f move that customer through that journey, collect that email address, collect that cell phone number, right? And all the messaging funnels directly through so that we can identify whether or not that video was effective beyond 
just somebody coming and looking at your website, then all of a sudden you have a very powerful integrated funnel. You have an integrated campaign. You've got your social working, you've got your search working, and you've got your email working. Now, all those three things are connected. Yeah. Or what happens when you watch a YouTube video and you didn't click the link below, but like, cause you got busy, your kids started screaming in the kitchen. You went to break up a fight and you completely forgot about it. And three weeks later, or two weeks or one week later, you're sitting there at work and you're like, Oh man, I'm going to check out that new gun. And you think of the gun. You don't remember the video, but you remember a key term associated with that video. If your site is not supporting that key term associated with that video, it's not going to rank. Right? So they go to Google and they go to look for it. And you spent all this money on a marketing campaign that was very effective up and down the backside of the hill. They're not going to go back and look for that video. They're going to try to find that product. Well, that's where search comes in. Right? So then you're collecting people based on that specific video messaging, right? So all messaging has to connect. All the, all the marketing continuity has to, from, from first touch to that customer journey all the way through. So that's where like when you start coupling these strategies, it's particularly digital. When you start coupling together, you get a very, very powerful outcome. I would even suggest that like something that's very big and it dramatically impacts um, search is um, affiliate marketing, you know? Affiliate marketing is very expensive marketing. I would argue that it's probably some of the most expensive marketing that we can do in the gun space, but it's incredibly valuable. It gives you backlinks. So like you have inbound links and when Google sees a link linking back to you, it raises what's called site authority. So then Google goes, oh, there's a bunch of people linking to this. It must be important. So when you search for this term, let's return this website, right? That's how that works. So then with affiliate marketing, you get that customer to come through. They buy something, the affiliate partner gets paid, you sold your product, you just captured customer data, they're now in your email marketing list, and now you are directly marketing to that customer for a much lower dollar amount, right? Well, that's why I love, personally, I love affiliate marketing. I've, I'm a big I do pro- too. proponent of it. I'm a big proponent of content marketing. I won't. Like I said, the customer journey is very important mm-hmm. to combine everything. You want your customer to go, I'm going to go to XYZ gun shop because I know that I can get educated. Mm-hmm. I can get the product I want. I can get this. And then they see your affiliate marketing. So, hey, uh, big time YouTuber supports them or big time. YouTuber. Right. And affiliate marketing is expensive. It uh, is. And, and that's kind of the world we live in because a, a lot of people... An average video, a YouTube video. I'm gonna say this because I, I there's a, I've had this long, deep conversation with these content creators. Is your average YouTube video is gonna cost them about three thousand dollars if you add in their time and their effort and everything like that. Mm-hmm. Minimum, the, minimum, and they have to make their ROI on it. And a lot of people are like, "Well, they're being shills for these companies. They're doing this. They're doing that." You, they got to make money. They're not going to do the video unless they know they're going to get the ROI on it. Yep. And we see a lot of people go after these content creators because they're going, well, they're shilling for this company or they're doing this. Well, they also believe in the product and they also I, do that. I totally listen. I, how many, we know a lot of content yeah. creators, right? And how many of them, probably everyone that I know won't pick up a product that they don't believe in. Right. It's, it would hurt them. It would hurt their own personal brand if they were to do that, right? It, you know, there's a bunch of uh, haters everywhere, you know? I just did a video. So we, we have a promotional giveaway platform also that we run, and usually we just do it for our, our customers. It's a lot of fun, right? It's called tacticalforish.com. So I literally just did a video where I come running out of my room. I'm in my flip-flops, and I pull this gun out of a bag, and I get a comment that says, you know, everything in that book, in that uh, video's textbook, except the flip-flops. <laughs> and I wrote, oh, you mean because I was going to have my range day boots on when a bad guy come driving up my driveway in the middle of Florida? <laughs> what do you mean? The flip-flops were intentional, dude. Right? But some, you're always going to have those people. They're going to say they're, the influencers are chilling. You you don't know what you're doing. Or, you know. I mean, we... Haters are going to hate. We've gotten some... <laughs> Oh well, I'm not gonna go in that. <laughs> oh no, maybe we yeah. should. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's up to it's up to the boss lady. Yeah. Listen, um, it's hey, listen, it's we need wild. to hate on the haters. Yeah, I mean, listen, 
I am totally fine with with people making fun of me. That's fine. Um, Who cares? I do anything on the internet. Don't say that. Don't ever say. <laughs> Comment that. below. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, but I do want to. I know we spend a lot of time on, on the marketing side, and and I think that's incredibly important. Because a lot of people don't realize how the industry works, mm-hmm. how the back end of right. of the industry works. Um, and it is a necessary piece of the puzzle. One of the things that you have been doing through 2A Commerce is simplification. Mm-hmm. Simplifying how things operate to help the mom and pop gun stores. Mm-hmm. To help the industry mm-hmm. combat a big tech world that ultimately doesn't want us to exist. They want to, whether you call it shadow banning or outright banning, delisting you, demonetize, like all of those aspects show where they are. I think, you know, Elon Musk has done a tremendous job of exposing those biases in big tech and bringing to light a lot of those issues. From your experience as 2A Commerce, as a marketing firm, how does that work? Well, the way we deal with it is that 100% of our par- our vendors, we vet them, right? Um I'm going to just say there's probably a ton of people that are listening to this right now that use MailChimp. MailChimp is statedly anti-firearm, right? Um, There are companies in the gun space that are still on Shopify, and they're like, well, we're not selling guns. I'm like, I know, but you're working with the enemy. You're working with the very people that is against every freaking value that you have. So the way that we do it is we put our money where our mouth is and we are able to go to our clients and say, your email list will not be shut down. Your server will not be shut down, right? We're not a host provider. That's not what we do. But the host provider that we partner with, we maintain our servers. They don't maintain our servers for us. But they are completely fine with the firearms website being hosted on their servers, right? The payment processors that we use are okay with firearms transacting, right, for firearms transactions. The email providers that we use are okay with emails going out related to firearms. So that's that's the way that we do that, right? Um, and then, of course, just being who we are, our clients are completely safe to talk to us and, you know, ask us, you know, this is what I want to do, how can we do this, and, you know, we all understand each other, right? So that's how we do that. So how does the political side start changing how you do business? Um, How do you prepare for things like when the Safer Banking Act is introduced Mm -hmm. and Section 10 has all of these ramifications for the firearms industry? How do you as a company look at this and go, okay, well, you know, here's what, how we're going to have to pivot. Here's, you know, obviously we're fighting that and we're, we're getting people on board and, and commenting. And if you haven't already, please, you know, go out to our website and, and comment, and let your voice be known on these issues. But how do you prepare for the political attack as well as the for-profit attack um, from this, uh, credit card processing standpoint. Yeah, with profound frustration <laughs> is where it starts, right? Um, the real answer is that I don't know that anyone could honestly tell you how to prepare for something that's not fully in place yet. And, you know, every time these uh, rules come down and, and, you know, they're not even voted by Congress, a lot of these rules, right? They're just... They're the administrative state that's been placed over us, unelected officials that are creating these rules that we now have to live by. They don't represent us, but they're forcing these rules on us, right? And um, when these rules come out, they're so complex 
right? That nobody can really anticipate or prepare for what's going to happen until we know what the final ruling is. And so that's the challenging part, right? And so you end up dealing with all of these things in hindsight. I think the way that we actually prepare with this is that a few brave men and women need to step up just like we did in 2019 and say, we're going to create an alternate banking infrastructure. We're not going to use the FDIC insurance, right? There's a really uh, there's a really cool company I like. They're called X uh, um, X Insurance. All right, these guys will underwrite anything, and the reason why they're able to do that is because they did it with all of their own money. Yeah. So I think what has to happen is that we have to get off the federal government dole, and the way that we prepare for it is by building the alternative. And I certainly have some ideas on that, but I'm not the person that can do it himself, right? That's why we built that crypto gateway. We're like, we're going to go build the alternative. So I think the preparation is not necessarily um, something that we develop a strategy as a reactionary component of some new policy that we don't even know what's going to be there in its conclusion. I think the real preparation is that a couple of really smart people need to come together and say, it's finally time to be done with this. And there's, there's people are out there, you know, there's gotta be people who are willing to say, just like we did, you know, don't go into the firearms industry. It's high risk. And I looked at them and said, I'm going into the firearms industry because somebody has to do something about this. Right? Like literally that's what has to happen. That's how we prepare. We have to find, identify those people. We need to come together. Great minds need to come together and we need to develop strategies and solutions that are outside of whatever vein I would argue evil people are trying to do to manipulate and control our freedoms and liberties. I think that's really it. You know, I don't know who those people are, but I'd like to meet them. I agree. I feel like we need to create something where that as people in the 2A community, we know where to shop. We know where to buy. We know who is behind us. Yeah. And if we can create that, there is a way. I mean, there's 30, 40 million of us now. How how hurt would uh big box store a b oh yeah if we go big box store b really supports us mm-hmm. and we're gonna go and we're gonna shop at big box store b i think you're getting to something that we've seen on on different issues as of recently within different movements where people are really understanding the value of your second vote Yes, you voted the ballot box. Right. And yes, those have tremendous yep. ramifications on who's elected and what kind of bills get introduced. And you should never discount the authority you have in the, the ballot box. Absolutely. On the, on the flip side of that, you have a second vote. And that vote is with your dollar. Mm-hmm. And then arguably you have a third vote. And that vote is your, with your feet. You can move out of a location that is radically anti-gun. You can vote and with your dollar and spend money at people who tremendously support you. Yep. Like there are so many options when it comes to I am going to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. I think that people fail to live by their own convictions, right? Maybe it's it's as much of an individual problem as it is a societal one. We just hired a developer, and um, my partner goes, hey, there's this new job board company called Red Balloon, and it's focused exclusively on conservative-minded people. I'm like, I'm not posting the job anywhere else but there, right? Found a great developer. Um, even LinkedIn, right? LinkedIn is, is very left-leaning. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's, it's complicated. I think you're right that we, the the second vote really, really matters. Um, 
you know, getting your feet to move, that goes back to really what I was just saying, that a couple of people have to be brave and step up and actually do something actionable, not just geographically, but also, you know. Yeah. And listen, I have seen firsthand Mm -hmm. the valiant people who stand up and fight impossible battles. And this kind of goes back to GOA's philosophy of ensuring that your voice is heard, whether that's through sending a postcard, sending an email, calling your representative, Mm -hmm. attending a town hall, letting your voice on an issue be heard and be amplified by people in your community. We have seen people who are anti-gun miss votes. Because they know that so many people were against them that, you know, magically they were they were out Mm -hmm. that day. We have seen people who were considered moderate actually take and, and vote the right way on an issue because they realized that if they didn't, they were not going to get reelected because so many people were against their noted stance on something on that note i will tell you this that every single time i get a notice from goa about an action alert to take i 100 percent send my comments in right so i suppose i would like everybody to know that we should all be doing this and if you know you support the goa if you're listening to this podcast that's like one little simple thing that somebody can do that you're talking about right make that voice known yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you for doing. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> well, you you said about moving your feet, and we've seen this mass exodus, uh, and that's the best way to call it from California, because people are, are and Illinois and Illinois and all these. The problem is, is if you're going to move your feet, and you were tired of the policies. Don't vote for those policies. Yeah, don't vote for those policies. <laughs> well, again. that's the problem, right? Look at te- look at what's happening in Austin, Texas. Yeah. You know, everybody left California, went to the amazing Austin, Texas, and Texas is great. And now all of a sudden, Austin is like a liberal island on a conservative sea. We're seeing the same thing in Arizona. Yeah. It's the same exact thing. Yeah, same exact thing in Arizona. And we... We're still protected in Florida. Yeah. Yeah. We yell at them when they come. We started yelling at them, You're not welcome here. It's not working. We yelled pretty loudly. I will say, you know, when we look... When we look at what's happened in the firearms industry yeah. as a whole and all of these companies moving to Tennessee, moving to Florida, moving to states that want them to do business in their state, mm-hmm. you see that the attacks are, I don't want to rephrase this, people are going to go where they can accomplish what they need to accomplish. Right. And what an amazing country we live in where you can pick and choose and and move and go to a place that has what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that should be ever underestimated. And you should never feel whether you live in California or New York or New Jersey, you have a, a hard, a hard fight ahead of you if you stay. But don't give up in the fight. Oh, you're you're saying that if somebody chooses to stay, mm-hmm. make that your battleground. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't don't stay complacent. Yeah. Because you know we've seen these breeding grounds mm-hmm. for bad gun laws, and um you you'll see it introduced one place and then oh, it yeah. catches like wildfire. But the more people that stand up and say absolutely not, the more people who are on record. And that we can file lawsuits and we can do those things on the on the flip side of that. And that's not to say that, that lawsuits are the end-all be-all. It is um, so much easier to fight something before it is passed than it is to fight with a lawsuit. I mean, if just to put it into perspective, you know, there, there's a bump stock case that is going before the Supreme Court. GOA had a, another bump stock case that was in a, a split decision that Um, and so we're really excited and we're watching this bump stock case, but let's not forget how many years ago the bump stock ban was right. Like these kind of things take such a long time to work through the courts. And although the bump stock was a, was a, um, executive, um, order, order, Mm -hmm. 
it it is so val- valuable to realize that you have to fight tyranny and you have to fight government overreach at every level that it's happening. And you, we don't have the um, afforded opportunity to sit on the sidelines or to sit on the fence. It is our job as gun owners. It is our personal responsibility as gun owners to stay informed, stay educated, and stay Absolutely. active. Yep. Well, we got to, they keep moving the goalposts and we keep giving up an inch or, oh, you know, our, our congressman will be like, well, we needed this to go through so we could pass this. Right. No, no more. No more. It's time for us as a, as a community and us as the silent majority to wake up and go, we're done with this nonsense and come out and say, we're done with this nonsense. Uh, you know, at, the moving the goalpost scenario is like exactly right. You feel like you feel like you, uh, okay, fine. We're going to do this. We're going to deal with this. And then, Oh wait, wait, those aren't the rules anymore. Right. My question. I mean, my question is like, where, what goalposts are we setting? You know, like how do we flip this thing from like when we're no longer reactionary, but we are the action. Yeah. Well, I think, we're seeing that trend starting to happen. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm, I'm very proud of the people who are, are standing up. Um, for those of you who might not know or might not, um, you know, stay glued to the GOA website, every uh, election si- cycle, we have the, the grades of all of the representatives that, and, and how they vote. That has been very valuable for me, by the way, in the past. Thank you for Fantastic. doing that. I'll let our uh, federal affairs team know. Yes, I, it's important. Thankfully, that is not my job. <laughs> <laughs> I know you'd rather stab your eye out with a pen than do that job, right? Um, <laughs> you, you know, I there are some jobs at GOA that I'm like, my goodness, thank you for not putting yeah. me in that position. Our legal yeah. team and our and our federal affairs team, I am so very thankful that I have never been asked to do those things. Right. Um, because I I don't have whatever that is that they have, it. but I'm so thankful that they have it. Absolutely. Um, and, and so major applause to, to those, to the, to those teams. They're amazing people, but, um, setting stakes. Yes. We've had people, um, introduce legislation like, uh, Mike Lee's, um, uh, Senator Lee's, um, Shush Act. And the Hearing Protection Acts. We've had people do the Shall Not Be Infringe Acts and the Right to Keep and Bear Arm Acts. Those, those are the bills that are so valuable that people are introducing, that are so valuable that people are um, co-sponsoring, that they're willing to put their name on the dotted line for their constituents saying this is where I stand because I represent you and this is where you stand. And that is where game time decisions are made Mm -hmm. because eventually we will have a position where we can pass those things and they can get signed and they can get enacted. But the problem is, is if the strategy goes and says, you know, we're just going to have this and when we have all, everything in place, then we'll work on it. You're never going to get to that right. place. And so I applaud all of our members of Congress that hear what, what GOA and our members are saying and what you as individuals are saying. And they're introducing these bills, even though they're unpopular or they appear unpopular, right. because in reality, we want to see a restoration of the Second Amendment. Yep. I mean, I, I would argue that we want to see a restoration of all of our liberties and freedoms, right? It's the Second Amendment that's the only thing that's preserving what we still have. Yeah. I mean, quite literally. How about the, how about the, uh, how about all the sheriffs out there that are mm-hmm. telling the feds, you know, to pound sand? Yeah. Like, they're setting some posts, right? Absolutely. Especially what we saw happen in New Mexico. Mm-hmm. With the sheriff going, yeah, no, that's unconstitutional. That was amazing. <laughs> like, that was that's not, absolutely not. Yeah, we not. will not be enforcing that. <laughs> that is. <laughs> Sorry, Governor. Yeah, that is such a powerful, a, a powerful thing. Yeah, absolutely. And that, and that that's his position. To, that's him to protect that, right? Mm-hmm. 
That's his job to protect that. I mean, how many in in hypothetical and we'll, we've we've seen this with uh, other substances and things like that. How many states does it take to go? Uh, no, or we're gonna mm. do this because we can because yeah. we have our state's rights, and we've seen it on uh, the. And again, this is sometimes to some people it's controversial. To other, we've seen this with marijuana. Mm-hmm. Marijuana has been legalized in states. When is it going to be states going? Uh, no, this is this is our I protected. I think right. you're seeing that in two big ways. Um, the first way I think you're seeing that is through the Second Amendment Preservation Acts that have been passing. And it every time we're, we're constantly um, upping the ante, getting it introduced in more state houses. Um, uh, Chris Stone and, and Michael Census run our uh, state and local affairs at GOA. This is a, a big priority for them. We've gotten um, most recently the one passed in Wyoming which is a phenomenal uh, SEPA. Um, in addition to that, I think you're seeing it with constitutional carry, where Absolutely. over 50% of the country has some form of permitless carry. Absolutely. Are they all perfect? No. no. Are there improvements uh, that should be made? Absolutely. And as a Tennessean, we need to we need to address our permitless carry and get a lot more um, it's not perfect and we can, we can make it perfect. As a Floridian, they just recently passed it as well. It's not perfect, right? Mm-hmm. You cannot open carry in Florida. Yeah. But there, are, but the fact is that these, um, permitless carry bills did pass. They did get signed and it is such a statement and we have got to continue that improvement. Right. You know what's interesting about the marijuana thing is that it used to be that, I I mean, at least I felt this way. Maybe I'm off, but let me know if you think this is kind of how it seems these days. It used to be like marijuana was telling the feds, we don't care what you say. We're going to pass our rules and we're going to make this, you know, a thing for our state. And at the federal level, at the, at the, uh, on the, on the, uh, on the gun side, there was a bunch of states that were going after the guns and the way that they were opening up marijuana, but the feds kind of protected it. So the feds kind of protected our kind of, right? Uh, that's the functional word, kind of protected our, you know, they were kind of the, the barrier there for a while. And it's almost like it's flipped, right? Like now the feds would probably love to see marijuana legalized so they could tax the daylights out of it and take more of our money. Um, I mean, not that I particularly care about marijuana, but, you know, you get the idea. And now now firearms are just so aggressively attacked at the federal level. Now you see the states that are starting to pick up the fight on that state level. Yeah, I think so. I think there's a few things that have changed as far as the state. um, Versus the feds. Yeah, I, I guess the state rights uh-huh. movement and the firearms and the and the constitutional carries and um and the SAPAs that have been introduced and I think that was something that started with the groundswell that was the say so movement. So in let's see, that would have been twenty nineteen is when all of the massive amounts of gun control happened in Virginia. You had the um, mandatory, I think it was like, let's see, there was the one gun a month. There was like a mandatory wait period, like all kinds of just, it went in this gigantic gun control package with all of these bills. It was a huge fight. Um, you can tell that I've been doing this for a little while because they're all starting to blend together. And yeah. I'm like, uh, man, if I knew we were going to be talking about this. I would have so prepped um, better. But um, you had all of these gun control packages in Virginia Pass. And it was devastating, especially because it's really just controlled by Northern Virginia and Richmond. Um, and you started to see the say-so movement, which were Second Amendment sanctuary ordinances, which is where the smallest 
municipalities and counties got together and they said, no, this is unconstitutional. Yeah. And we don't like this. And we're going to pass this resolution or we're going to pass this ordinance. There were two essentially versions. And it caught on like wildfire. And GOA pushed this tremendously. Again, massive credit to our state and local team. And we put out, it's still on our website. If you want to go check it out and try to get it passed in your county, I'm all about the groundswell. Um, But you can download the template. And people would take it to their county commissions and people were on the ground. And this passed all over Virginia. And what people started doing is they started seeing the groundswell in Virginia. And the next thing you know, it started spilling over. And then all across the country, these say-sos were happening. Say-sos are what have led us to the SAPAs that we're seeing now start to catch fire at the state and local level. And what's SAPA? Second Amendment Preservation Acts. Um, sorry. For the audience. <laughs> I, uh, you and your acronyms. <laughs> me and my acronyms, me and my soapbox. We get real acquainted real fast. <laughs> well, you know what happens? You know what happens when you live that, just like you said. By the way, your your mental capacity to keep all these orders is truly impressive to me. It's like I don't think I could do it, you know? There's like there's stuff spilling out of my brain constantly. But um yeah, I I mean I'm happy to say that St. John's County, my county in Florida, is a, you know, second amendment sanctuary county. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's. And I reap the benefit of that. Yeah. As a gun owner. I live in the Wild West, so I really don't worry much. I mean, Arizona's pretty. You say (laughs) that now. I say it now. Right. But But now. Okay. So let's let's talk about setting posts and stakes. Right now's Mm -hmm. the time to get those passed. No, absolutely. Because let's look, going back to Tennessee, because I, you know, it's my home state. Yeah. I love, I love being a Tennessean. But the same governor that signed our permanent permitless carry bill is the same governor to call a special session to pass red flag laws. As a gun owner, you cannot afford to check out. You cannot afford to take your foot yeah, off the gas. Absolutely. You have to stay vigilant. As a business owner that's a firearms owner, you cannot afford to check out for the sake of your business. Right? As a father with children, I cannot afford for the sake of my family to check out of what's knowing what's going on with the Second Amendment. Right. I mean, it really correlates to nearly every aspect of life. It's not just it's just not just our gun rights. It's like, what are the secondary and tertiary implications of taking our gun rights from us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, maybe maybe you own a gun and I mean, how many people own a gun and have a box of ammo in the dresser and, and they've never fired it. Probably far too many. Right. I'd love to change that. I want, I try to get people out to shoot with me all the time. It's like, Hey, let's go shoot. You want to hey, meet new people? What do you do? Oh, I, you know, I shoot. Everybody's intrigued. Oh, you've shot before. Come on, let's go do it again. Right. But my point is that if these people could come to understand that, that thing they value their job, or their family, and what's happening with firearms directly correlates to those two things, they might start to pay attention more to what's happening with firearms. Yeah? I'm going to do this, and our audience is here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to challenge everybody, and because there's this movement's already happening, so I want to push and challenge everybody. Every second of every month, so every second day of every month, I want you to take a new person out to the range or go to the range. I mean, and separate the second on the second, and I want to encourage everybody to do that because it is a there is a movement who of, of people who do that, but I want to encourage you we look, get more people involved, get people out on the second. Let's make the second of the month, the Second Amendment Day, and go out. It should be every day, but let's get them. Let's get out there and start doing this absolutely, and then we can start growing this movement even. Even bigger. Absolutely. I have very few friends who don't own firearms, but I have a lot of friends that own firearms and shoot maybe once a year. I'm constantly, let's go, let's go blast some rounds. Let's go have some fun. Right. One of my favorite things to do these days is to launch Bud Light cans and use them as clay targets and shoot them with shotguns. That's awesome. It's so much fun. (laughs) Something just feels so right about it. (laughs) 
I 1000% agree. Like we, we, anytime you get to go out on the range, it's a good time. Yeah. And, and I think that the more we can make that a priority in every day life, the better off we are. I, can I interject here real quick? Yeah. I'm going to tell you a super cool story that happened to me last night. I'm flying here to Myrtle Beach to do this podcast with you guys. I sit down next to a pilot who's catching a flight home because he was done with this shift. We get to talking. And naturally, I talk to everybody on the plane about guns. Every time I fly, which is a lot, right? Come to find out this guy has never been hunting. And I turned and looked at him. And I said, hey, man, I'm going to give you my business card. And if you actually want to go hunting, you need to call me and I'm going to take you and teach you how to harvest your own food. And I looked at him. I said, I make these kind of offers to people all the time and most of them don't follow up, but I'm dead serious. Right. Anyway, I, th- I was just, I forgot about this until you just were saying we need to all go do this. Like literally I did this last night it was, you know, I hope he calls me. Yeah. No, I I think that when someone shows an interest, even if it's a faint interest in something related to the Second Amendment, how you engage that conversation in those few minutes can radically change a person's perspective and their willingness to get involved. Mm -hmm. You have so much tremendous power as an individual and you don't have to have a platform. You don't nope. have to be an influencer to influence people exactly and get involved in the second amendment. It's everyday people engaging in everyday life, right? Like it has to be there on your lips. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously you have tremendous uh, knowledge in marketing and SEO and credit card processing. You're a true advocate for the second amendment. Mm-hmm. We've been talking about all of the things that um, are important as far as what is happening happening on the state level, on the federal level, when it comes to making business happen. So would you mind plugging your website, your socials, everything uh, to close us are, out? Thank you. Uh, we're 2acommerce.com, 2A for the Second Amendment. Um we have a marketing platform called tacticalfreesh.com. That's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram. And uh, I always tell people phone calls are free. I mean, for the most part these days, right? So, um, you know, if anybody had a question about any of the things that we talked about related to marketing or, or payments or, or tech, I'd love to talk to them, you know? Um, so I'd encourage them to just hit us up with the web form and, you know, we have a 24 hour rule minimum, so we're going to call you back. And, um, yeah. And if there's a couple brave people out there that want to get together and start building the alternate infrastructure, I'm completely down. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> Perfect. Very nice. Well, thank you for joining thank us. You. Yeah. Thanks for having me guys. This was great. Awesome. Well, that was fun. That was fun. Man. How'd I do? Oh Well, I'm kind of glad you did. It kind of, because I, I, 